everybody. Uh, this is uh, a CSDMS webinar. Um, I'm very excited about uh, today's speaker, Wim, but um, I will let uh, Sam introduce Wim. So uh, Sam Harrison uh, works at the UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology. Um, he is kind of uh, bridging between CSDMS uh, US and CSDMS uh, Europe, or at least try to uh, wrangle a European community around numerical modeling like we do here with CSDMS uh, in the United States. Um, and I'm gonna hand it over uh, to Sam. Uh, so go ahead, Sam. Thank you very much. Yeah, so you folks might already know, and, and I've seen a few familiar faces here, but we've we've been arranging a few of these systems webinars as kind of Euro CSDMS webinars, um, which I've been kind of co-hosting. And as Albert says, the, the goal there is really to bring this wonderful systems community that you have that's largely US-based uh, and make it a bit broader, make it a bit more, I suppose, applicable to European audiences. So hence a slightly friendlier time zone for us European folks. Apologies to, to you guys in the US. I know it's very early. Um, and with speakers and with topics that are potentially a little bit more lined with Europe, but obviously the topic of today's talk is, is broadly applicable um, across the globe. Um, I just want to do one little bit of advertising before I do introduce Vim. Um, so as part of this Euro Systems initiative, we've got a workshop that we're organising um, in October this year. Um, so save the date and the dates are the 28th to the 31st of October. Um, we're going to be holding a workshop in the Lake District in the northwest of the UK. Um, and the, the tentative theme of the workshop is what does the next generation of environmental modeling look like? Uh, and it can be as, as broad as we want that, that topic to be. Um, we'll be sending out information via the usual channels about this um, pr pretty soon. So, but for the moment, just watch this space. Um, yeah, so that's that's everything I had to say about Eurosystems. Um, so yeah, it's my pleasure to delight, to, it's my pleasure and delight to welcome uh, Wim van der Bawida. Um, hopefully I got that pronunciation <laughs> approximately correct. Um, welcome him to this webinar today. He's kindly um, agreed to give a talk to us on, as Albert says, a, a topic that's you know really interesting to a lot of us. Um, and that's basically the sustainability of computing. Um, so Vim's, Vim's talk is, is entitled Frugal Computing uh, on the need for low carbon and sustainable um, computing. Um, so Vim, if you'd like to load up your slides um, and we'll do the usual, we'll, Vim will give his talk and then there'll be a discussion session at the end and we've got plenty of time then to take folks' questions and dive into the subject a little bit uh, more deeply. So over to you, Vim. Thank you very much, Sam. And thank you everyone for coming. Uh, so I hope you can see the slides, if anyone can confirm. Yep, we can. Yes. Oh. All right, brilliant. So um, yeah, I'll say a few words about myself before going into the talks. I'm a professor at the University of Glasgow in the School of Computing Science. and um, I've been interested in, or let's say aware and interested in the issues of, of climate change for a long time. And in the last few years, I've been specifically looking at the impact of computing um, on emissions. And so this is what this talk is about, um, looking at um, the emissions targets and uh, what um, percentage is accountable for by computing and so on, what the trends are, things like that. So um, let's first give some global context, which I imagine you all know really, um, but still I repeat it quickly. Um, if we want to keep uh, global warming below 1.5 degrees, or um, it probably is already two degrees or so, anyway, if we want to limit it as much as possible, we must um, drastically keep uh, cut our greenhouse gas emissions and we must do that now. Um, we can't really afford to wait. And uh, unfortunately, this would require um, revisiting our economic model. 
um i say unfortunately but okay that's just the reality um and all this is is uh, from the ipcc report so it's not me saying that um and so where i come in is on computing um computational resources since the 70s have been growing dramatically we've been using increasing amounts of computational resources um and um, we were lucky for a long time that the growth of the performance per watt that we use to, to do computation has been exponential. So basically you got twice as much performance every year and a half or so. And um, as a result, computing has become pervasive in, in today's society. And um, also as a result, we've effectively been treating compute computational resources as infinite um, because you know, with an exponential curve, where there's no clear end inside, that seems to be what happens, right? Um, but it is computational resources like any resource on uh, are finite and the growth that we have in demand for computing actually is no longer offset by the increased power efficiency. So we already um, have a growth in, in um, energy consumption from computing as a result. And also um, Moore's law and Kumi's law, these laws that govern that exponential growth, um, they can no longer save us because uh, these trends are, are flattening off and so our efficiency gains are nearly gone. Um, and the consequence is that with business as usual, the carbon footprint from the use of computing um, will become a major contributor to the world total um, if we want to stay within our uh, emission targets. Um, so this is just using computers. Um, the carbon footprint of produ production of computing devices is also huge. And the problem with that is Moore's law has made us used to very short lifetimes of compute hardware. Essentially, we've been lazy. We've said, okay, if we just wait a year and a half, we have a faster, bigger, bigger, better computer. So we will do that and we will buy new computers. And then we don't have to um, do our best to use, to, to get better performance out of the old ones. Um, but that rate of obsolescence, like um, renewing your system in on a cycle of less than two years, is really completely unsustainable. And so um, therefore I coined the term frugal computing, which means that as a society, we need to start treating computational resources as finite and as precious. So that means we utilize them only when necessary and then as frugally as possible. Um, and computing scientists and developers and engineers, um, our role is to ensure that you can do that that you can be efficient, that you can do uh, compute tasks with lowest possible energy consumption. Um, and uh, so because the lifetime of the compute devices also need to be extended dramatically because um, that's the only way to get down the carbon from making, the carbon emissions from making the devices, um, we cannot really count on new technologies to uh, get this, um, this uh, reduction in, in efficiency. So we, we essentially have to use what we have and use it um, very frugally. Uh, that's the, the tenet of frugal computing. Um, so now I want to look a bit at the scale of the challenge there. Um, so first of all, the climate targets. So to limit global warming um, to below two degrees by 2040, we would need to go from 55 to 13 gigatons, which is like, so we, we had 20, um, 55 gigatons in um, 2020 or, or so, and uh, we would need to go to 20 to 13 by 2040. Um, that would be, mean we need to cut like five to 7% per year. Um, but unfortunately at the moment, the emissions are still rising um, by one to 2% per year. So um, the amount we need to cut if we want to still get there in time, it gets more and more. And, um, from that uh, emissions budget, about 10 gigatons is from electricity, so out of that 55. But uh, that is uh, rising steeply because, well, if we um, want to move to, for example, electric vehicles, then um, that electricity um, is, is replacing the direct uh, combustion engines, but that electricity is not completely um, green, of course. Um, and so in fact, we still majority generated by burning fossil fuel. Um, and unfortunately for, for the climate targets, um, 
renewables and nuclear won't save us. Um, the deployment is, is way too slow, even though the, the deployment of renewables is incredibly fast, um, faster than anyone had expected. Um, it is still not uh, fast enough to get us to um, no fossil fuels by uh, 2040. And with nuclear, it's even worse because it just takes 20 years to build a new uh, plant. Uh, and it takes a long time to get planning permission as well. And so it's not realistic to think that we will have um, a sizable increase in nuclear power um, in the next few years, which is what we would need if we want to have um, replaced the, the fossil fuels by nuclear by 2040. And then there is carbon capture and storage. Um, and essentially, um, I'm quoting here from a report that uh, was done by um, a UK research and innovation um, project uh, on how we could get our research infrastructure to net zero. But in short, um, it looks like greenwash. Um, so there is actually no um, evidence that it is scalable to the degree that we need it, and it will certainly not be scalable in time. So maybe um, later, we can use this, uh, but at the moment it will not help us reach the climate targets, which is what matters, because if we don't meet the climate targets, um, then we get effectively um, catastrophic uh, climate um, breakdown in the sense that large parts of um, what is now habitable will become uninhabitable and so on. Well, you know this probably better than me, um, but uh, you know reducing the warming is, is the, the imperative at the moment. So then there's carbon offsetting, which other, some people claim uh, is what you simply do. You know, for example, you do a long haul flight, you offset it. But if you look at the maths there, it doesn't really hold up because um, the Earth's land ecosystem can really not hold that much um, CO2 uh, so compared to what we emit. So essentially, we would uh, be able to sequester about two years of emissions at the current emission rates. So again, this is a good thing to have if we have very low emission rates, um, but uh, the way it's done at the moment, it doesn't help us. So all we can do is reduce emissions, um, which seems to be obvious, but uh, it's not what you hear very much. Um, so you need to reduce energy consumption and you need to reduce the amount of goods produced because um, there is emissions resulting from production of goods as well. Um, and that's of course, largely an economic problem. Um, but still, there is an important role to play for technology um, because, well, we can look at um, solutions for, for example, making things more efficient, making devices last longer, that kind of thing. So let's now look a bit at computing itself. Um, in 2020, the emissions from computing, uh, the use of computing, just co doing computations, was about th between three and three half percent of the total by the best estimates. Um, that's already more than the airline industry, so um, the much maligned airline industry. Okay, that's not an entirely fair comparison because um, the emissions from the airline industry are only one part of the story. But still, it, it puts it into perspective. This is a large amount of emissions. And this is set to, to grow a lot by um, 2040. And in fact, um, if the AI hype doesn't die down, it will be worse. Um, but suppose it, uh, it is simply the, the projected growth uh, before AI uh, appeared on the scene, then already we would have five gigatons of CO2 from use of computers by 2040. And um, from making the devices, we could add another um, five gigatons because uh, broadly speaking, the embodied carbon and the carbon from use are, are about the same order. In fact, for most applications, the embodied carbon is larger. So this, this 10 gigatons is conservative. Um, but that's actually, you know, rem remember at the start, I said we have a budget of 13 gigatons of CO2 uh, emissions by 2040. So if computing, uh, if we don't um, reduce the emissions from computing, we would be using 80% of that uh, budget purely to do computing, um, which is ludicrous, right? So it looks a bit like this in the graph. So in 2020, the red bar there is computing compared to all the other emissions, it's not large. But if we're serious about bringing the emissions down, but we overlook computing, um, then uh, we overlook a huge elephant in the room. So just to look a bit at where all those emissions are coming from, um, and 
if you look at the internet, actually like 85% of the traffic on the internet is video. And um, the problem why this is growing is mostly because uh, vendors are pushing higher definition video, even though essentially the human eye can no longer see that difference in, in resolution, but it's a way to sell more um, television sets. And uh, so that's what's been happening. But the consequence is, of course, that you increase both the the traffic on the internet, you increase the load on um, encoding of those videos, and then you get people to buy more uh, new television sets and uh, all that results in a, a serious growth in emissions. Um, fortunately, the hype about VR, AR has died down because otherwise this would have been even worse because this, these are 3D uh, voxels of information you have to transmit rather than 2D pixels. Um, and so if that had taken off at scale, it would have been pretty bad. Um, then the other uh, huge growth driver is IoT, so the Internet of Things. This is all those little gadgets that people have in their homes, but also um, devices used for instrumentation of, of uh, production facilities and things like that. Um, so these are generally small devices and they don't consume a lot of power. But of course, the, the I in IoT means Internet. That means there is actually a network and cloud uh, connected to that device, and that's what causes the footprint. But even just making them already uh, has a non-negligible footprint simply because making chips is, is a, a process that creates um, a lot of um, equivalent emissions. And then we come to AI. Uh, so when I did this talk first, this wasn't even on, on the cards really, um, but now it's pretty terrible uh, in terms of the projections. And um, for example, I think people don't really realize that if you do a query using ChatGPT, it consumes 60 times more energy than a conventional search. Um, and uh, that's just one example. And due to the hype, uh, the growth in uh, uh, you know ad adoption of applications that use generative AI is really steep. I mean, there is AI in everything nowadays, even if it's often fortunately not real AI. Um, and unfortunately, the governments have bought into this hype uh, quite large scale. And that would, will, I mean, I think what we are having is a bubble that will burst. But because of this buy-in from governments and so on, uh, it will actually have a longer life than, than normal bubbles really have. Um, but if we would do this, um, if we would look, look, for example, at what OpenAI says they would need for computing, um, we would uh, easily increase our emissions purely uh, for their needs by a factor of 10, um, which is really dramatic. I mean, it means that this, the needs of this one company would be enough to make the world miss its climate targets. Um, so this, uh, we can only hope that it doesn't get that far, right? Um, okay, so apart from that, mobile devices are still also a major growth driver. Um, and that's mainly due to the short replacement cycles, um, because um people are kind of well incentivized to replace their phones quickly um and just as with iot actually your mobile phone doesn't consume a lot of electricity but uh, the network and cloud consumes a lot of electricity and the manufacturing of devices too has a large footprint and then with mobile you have the specific mobile infrastructure and the problem with that is that um when you go from one generation to the other the previous generations have to be kept active for a long time, and therefore you get concurrent um, usage of of a large, so of this large infrastructure, and not in a very in an energy efficient way. Um, so this gave a picture of of uh, what actually drives these um, emissions. Um, so what what can how can we get to frugal computing? Um, and I think what we need is really to transform computing so that um, we we really um, think of computing from uh, every time we think of computing, we think of how can we do a certain amount of compute with the minimum amount of emissions rather than um, saying the cheapest way or the way that will make most money. Um, and um, so it means we must reduce the carbon emissions from producing and, and making and uh, using computers 
and um, so that's mostly making um, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done on the software side to make uh, the operation more efficient. And on the other hand, there is work to be done on keeping the, the hardware alive for as long as possible. Um, and so in the longer term, we should really start working on technologies that by default have lifetimes of, of several decades. And it's not really that hard because like, um, it's quite possible to create chips that last a hundred years. Uh, so the reason why we do don't do these things is mostly economical, right? So therefore we need a change in, in the business models and in the consumer attitudes. Um, because if, if uh, businesses keep pushing uh, short replacement cycles and consumers keep wanting that, then of course uh, it's very hard to uh, achieve change. So we must raise awareness of the problem and particular education, um, because the younger we can start with educating our kids that about this kind of issues, um, the more aware they will be when they um, get at the, the age that they become consumers. Um, and so we must provide incentives for behavioral change, both on the end user and on, on the um, uh, producer side. So we must provide economic incentives and policies. But on the other hand, we also must make sure there's an infrastructure um, for repair and maintenance and training for the people who have to do it. So all that is a, is a huge job, but um, I think we have to believe that we can do this. Um, so then what can we do as kind of uh, individuals and in particular uh, academics? I think it's really important not to buy into this hype that yeah, renewables, nuclear, uh, carbon storage, offsetting, that this is all we need. Um, this is not true. These things will not save us. We really need to reduce electricity usage when we talk about computing. Um, and we need to reduce emissions from manufacturing um, because otherwise we will simply not arrive at this reduction in CO global CO2 emissions that we need uh, by 2040. So um, that's really the important message. Um, specifically on ICT for research, um, so I hope I haven't gone too long so that we have time for questions on this, but um, I was involved in a project uh, to look at how we could get the digital research in infrastructure of the UK to net zero. Um, and this involved not only the, the supercomputers, but also um, the um, desktop uh, machines and things like that. Um, and I've also been working um, on looking at the life cycle analysis specifically for, for scientific computing, for supercomputing, looking at um, how long you need to, uh, so what the replacement cycles should be um, if you uh, have a certain kind of carbon intensity in, in the area where, uh, where you're active. So I can talk a lot about this if you want um, in the questions. Um, but that is my talk and thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much. That was uh, that was really fascinating, and I've I've written down um, loads of questions. Um, but we'll open it up to the floor first um, to see if other folks have questions. Um, Moira, I noticed yeah, you'd already I posted should. one. Actually, do you want to? I'll stop sharing, then I can see what people. Sure, are sure thing. It's like uh, yeah. everything that you were saying. So, so thank you so much, and women. It's it's uh, wonderful to to meet you. I'm at Northeastern University in Boston. Right. And you know, like this, this, it's 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 just it's distressing, uh, <laughs> but like not something that I didn't know. I was just, uh, you know, like the whole issue of greenwashing is is very pervasive and very detrimental, and um, and so it's it's good that there are you know studies that support, you know, like the the things that you've been saying that I've been saying too, but like I just didn't have enough. Yeah. of support for that because there's there's actually not that much out there uh showing the 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 dangers especially in in this realm and, and i can give you an example of just like you know conversations we've been having in my institution and about like you know again like it's all about accelerating and 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 thinking of growing and accelerating the 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 transition from science to impact and i'm like but but the problem is you know like i've been trying to say like have we been thinking about that it's not just about 
expanding on our HPC, you know, and it's it's like there's a cost that comes with that. And like, are we thinking about that? Because otherwise we're shooting ourselves in the foot. And I gave the example of the kinds of technology that I build that I try to keep as cheap as possible uh, precisely for this reason, but also for access reasons and for, for mm-hmm. uh, you know, being able to reason through things instead of like doing, you know, these humongous models that nobody understands. So, but it's like, I, when I pose that question, there was just like crickets in the background and, and then just saying like, oh, well, but this is the reason why we put it next to a dam rather than, and I'm like, yes, that's wonderful, but it doesn't really address the issue, you know? <clears throat> And and of course, like there's like the issues of cooling and like the necessity of cooling as well as you know just running this thing, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't even talk about that, but the water usage is is um, right. also staggeringly high. <laughs> exactly. So so I was just, ex- I mean, excited that there's some studies and you were sharing some links. And so, is there something that we can build on to just elevate and amplify this message? Is my question. Like, is there something that has already been published, and is growing? Um, you know, that we can use to really have a more systematic and and serious conversation that goes beyond well, what I know as a system scientist. You know, probably the um, especially in academic concept context this report that we did for the so digital research infrastructure net zero project is probably very relevant it's it's huge um it's there's a lot in it but it's also very well researched Mm -hmm. and so therefore um it's like say in an academic context it will be convincing um in a more public context it's too big you have to kind of break it down into uh, neat little bits but um that is uh, so that's why i linked it in my slides because I think that's a good starting point for most people. Um, on the other hand, I must say, like, I'm not too worried about the emissions from HPC. Um, they are small in com- compared to anything else. It's just that I think as academics, we have an example function. And so we should give lead by example. And that means right. we should try um, not not just go for expansion, like you say. We should try to do see if we cannot do the job um, with what we have and be a bit smarter about the way we do things rather than uh, just um, buying a bigger computer, right? Yeah, no, but but also, I mean, that was just an example of a conversation mm-hmm. I had, but like there's all of this stuff about AI and the push for AI. Yeah. Like, let's embrace it because it's happening anyway. And I'm like, there's so many problems with it, like ethically speaking, and like this aspect, nobody's talking about or not enough. And so it's great. So uh, is this the link that Albert posted um, that you were of your report uh, I, I don't know what this is this is CERN so let me have a quick look what this is is it is it the wrong one I I tried to memorize your link on the I think it was the last <laughs> slide and no, I think no, I have the um, first part good no this this is not the same um I had two links Apologies. the first link was um was about this this DRI report. The second link is about the life cycle analysis, and that was on the CERN uh, website because I did this work with somebody from the, Nor- the Norwegian Supercomputer Center, and um, uh, okay. he presented it at CERN. Um, yeah, no, so that that report is on Zenodo. Um, I can I'll put paste if that helps. I can paste the link directly in yes, the chat here would, as well. Um, that would be and, great. And it looks like uh, Bert. Uh, put a Sonodo link there. So please check right, if that's okay. the right yeah. one or not. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can. And apologies for pasting in the the wrong link. Well, <laughs> oh, it's it's also relevant. <laughs> <laughs> it's relevant. Um, Great, thanks. Um, are there any other questions from folks? I'll let... Yeah, when, uh, this is really... Um, I, I'm I'm trying to reduce my uh, carbon footprint, so this talk is really to my heart. So so thank you for for presenting this and and making us all aware of, you know what's what's happening and what we can what we might expect in the future if we continue you know the the same way we've always continuing I guess and also with computing. I, one one question I have is. Um, 
uh, the the whole Bitcoin industry is kind of blamed for a huge carbon footprint, right? And I'm I'm wondering if if that um, how would you say that 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 entity that 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 activity is part of your analysis, or if if that's um, not even included in your analysis, um, and if it is included, could you do you have an indication roughly of you know what is the percentage of contribution of bitcoins to this picture? Well, so it's not in the analysis that I based the talk on, and I'll, I'll paste the link to that as well. And I mean. I, I I can give you lots of links actually, um, <laughs> but um, I didn't even look at that because I did look at it. But my conclusion is that actually in the total picture it is small, um, and the growth, fortunately, because the um, the crypto bubble has burst, so the growth is not dramatic. Um, there is still growth, and it's still bad actually. I mean, this is like. I think Bitcoin consumes as much electricity as uh, something like France or Germany uh, by now. And of course, that, that is way too much for something that, um, I mean, I don't think it's justifiable. And it's also the bad thing with Bitcoin is that it skews the whole chip industry because um, they take up, they produce all these, these um, mining chips that have hu huge embodied emissions. But meanwhile, um, so they, they kind of, um, well, there is an economic problem with that too, the, in terms of capacity and fabs. Not that I worry too much, because uh, if you're going to make a lot more chips, <laughs> it's not necessarily a good thing. But yeah, so Bitcoin has. It's also the problem is that that a lot of the um, the mining activities have a very bad effect on the locations where they do it locally, um, apart from their global high footprint, right? Um, but so it's not like. If you look at, if you have to weigh, say, Bitcoin versus AI, AI at the moment is a lot worse because um, it has so much buy-in from uh, high high people with a lot of power, let's say, um, and uh, that it could actually get, um, the, the growth could be sustained for, for quite a long time. Um, and with Bitcoin, I don't really see that happen. Uh, I, I think um, it's still... I mean, although the bubble has burst, it's still there and it's still a lot of emissions. But um, I, I, in fact, Bitcoin is not really like I mean, the Bitcoin people dream of um, having Bitcoin as, as um, national currencies. But economically, that's not really possible. So it's not going to happen. So I'm not worried about that. You see, the, the, the growth will always be a bit limited because the, the use of Bitcoin is limited per se. Um, you can't use it as a fiat currency, really, because uh, it's actually... Okay, let's not get into economics there. Um, Yanis Varoufakis has a very good talk about this, if you want to know. <laughs> but so, yeah, in summary, Bitcoin is really bad, but it, um, at the moment it's not the worst and the growth is not huge. So, um, yeah, um, uh, it's not my main focus really of uh, for emissions. Um, really, at the moment, it's all the tech companies um, who expand data centers primarily for AI. I mean, really, I was reading about this um, deal. So it's a 10 billion deal for data centers in Saudi Arabia. And um, all those companies that pretend to be so green, like, like Microsoft in particular, are in on that deal. And so Saudi Arabia is 99% fossil fuel generation. Yeah. Also, for cooling, it's really bad because it's in the desert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but nevertheless, they're going to put their data centers there. So that that shows that their their intentions really, when they talk about um, reducing emissions, are not sincere. This is simply uh, greenwash. This is to make us buy their products, right? And feel not feel bad when we do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Um, I had exactly the same question there, Alvin, <laughs> so thank you for asking that. Um, I've just spotted the latest update to Zoom. It's got an, an AI companion at the bottom. So you're right. This is just seems to be becoming kind of <laughs> everywhere yeah. we go. There is some kind of AI thing that companies are uh, joining in on. Um, yes. I had a I had a question about regulation and and basically do you, I think I think one of your slides you did 
you did say that there, there is a role for regulation here. Um, mm. And I was, I was wondering if you had reflections on, you know, what kind of regulation you would see as being effective, like what kind of scales would that be at? You know, how how is it best targeted to be impactful? I think the most effective thing, um, both in terms of, say, economics and politics, would be um, that cap and trade would be extended to uh, the ICT sector. So cap and trade is a scheme where... Um, in certain sectors of industry are asked to cap their emissions, but if they exceed them, they can trade with other uh, businesses in the same sector that have uh, uh, a surplus, or, I mean, in credits, right? So that didn't emit so much. Um, and I, I did, I'm not an economist, but I did some reading up about this, and this has been used for other emissions, like for sulfur dioxide and so on, um, with good effect. And it turns out that if you do like a carbon tax or you do a cap and trade scheme, you will they both will achieve their goals, but I think politically a cap and trade scheme will be more acceptable than um, a carbon tax because people don't like tax, right? <laughs> and especially companies don't like tax. So, but at the moment, the, the fact that the emissions from um, from ICT are quite considerable is kind of overlooked. So, um, this cap and trade focuses more um, on on, uh, for example, like uh, the petrochemical industry. Uh, so that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that, that would be a good way to reduce emissions from ICT, I think. Um, the other thing is, um, and that is really happening as a very positive thing is, uh, uh, especially in, in Europe then, there is um, the right to repair legislation, which is also ever being extended uh, and expanded so that um, because you know the, the European Parliament they actually listen when they do a consultation so when people say don't forget the software they actually listen and say okay we won't forget the software um, and so um, I think this is going the right direction in the sense that it will make it much easier to um, extend the life of devices and so yeah that is therefore a crucial type of regulation so um, because it, it requires also that the devices are made differently because they have to be repairable. Um, it, and uh, it means essentially, I think companies, when they have for, are forced to adhere to that regulation, um, they have to rethink a bit how they make their devices and, and they will therefore uh, last longer, I think. So um, I think that's, these are two, this is a very good trend that is already happening. The cap and trade would be a good thing. Um, that's the main things that, I, that I've been thinking of. Uh, that that would be effect effective. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, that I wrote that point down actually when you were talking about the HD video, and I've mm. I've always thought it's really stupid the fact that you can stream super high quality video that you can't even view, you can't even perceive with your naked eye. And I was yeah. wondering whether there's a role for regulation there that I'd, I don't know how it'd be enforced or whatever, but it seems a really it's a low-hanging fruit, fruit, really. I think, and it's a stupid thing that we do. Yeah, yeah, it's true. What I don't understand is that actually the um, the companies still do it like that because it would be very advantageous for them to stream lower quality video and um, pretend that it's high quality video. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> because yeah. you wouldn't see it anyway. Um, yeah. But yeah, of course, that would be misleading the customer, and that that is, uh, you see, it's it's perversely as the other way around, right? Um, when they promise something, they have to deliver on it. Yeah. Um, it, it I don't have... see really. I mean, you could always have regulation that that addresses such things, but you don't want. I, I I'm sure the current types of uh, with our current economic system and the way um, governments work, they don't really want to do that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, because it seems too much uh, um, telling industry what to do. Right? So, but I yeah. can see something like a, um, a carbon tax or at least a tax on externalities coming in um, not, in not too far future. I think this will be necessary. Uh, Moira, I see you have your hand up. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I'm, so I'm in the policy school, right? So I, I, I work on policy. I work okay. uh, not necessarily on regulations, but I, I teach about it. But like I, I also have been an activist, uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, I, I had to 
due to personal reasons that were like, you know, where my family was exposed to highly toxic mm-hmm. uh, uh, substances that was not known for us. So in the context of the US and in a lot of other countries, I don't know how it is in Europe uh, or in other places, but like I'm also from South America. So I, you know, and I worked for the government there uh, as well, which I swore never to do again. So, um, so, so from that perspective, what I could see though, and is one of the big elephants in the room that we also need to think about is the fact that corporate lobbying and and the fact that mm-hmm. they really are pushing for these things. So one of the things that I was an activist against, activist against, was five G and the rollout of five G, because that meant essentially in 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 residential areas, and uh, and so that meant antennas all over the place in residential areas that had uh, you know impacts, uh, health impacts on on people. You should not be exposed to this kind of radiation. It does cause health problems with the exposure to this radiation. So in addition to all of the stuff that you're talking about, there's also this other aspect of, of this kind of, of, of technology. Mm-hmm. And so I got involved as an activist and like looking at how the lobbying of these corporations uh, work. And so going to like, you know, it would be beneficial even for the company. Yes, it would be beneficial, but they are in this whole model of self-reinforcing growth and of course they have more and more power and there's less and less regulation because they get to lobby for that and they have many more resources than activists and citizens and 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 people who are just not part of this corporate world um and so that's what we are fighting against and that's what we are dealing with and that we also have to think of like how to so like for example the cap and trade system the carbon taxes they've been discussed for decades right and they don't go very far, like the, especially in the context of the U.S., it does not go very far. Um, and and so there are other conversations that need to be had, but we we really need to focus on the really uh, pernicious effect of of corporate lobbying and corporate power in that that then get into the political process and co-opt it and do not allow for these kinds of regulations to to happen. And it's not about. Mm-hmm. Oh, we don't want to tell businesses what to do. Well, you know what? We should. <laughs> we, sh- we should, because you know, as Donna Lamedo said, you you want big business, you need big government, right? Um, otherwise, it just like really destroys the system from within. Uh, that's essentially what we're seeing. Is is that is a result of of that? Uh, but we have to also, from our perspective, look into that and what that kind of arrangement does that prevents these regulations for. Mm-hmm. From happening or these institutional structures and checks and balances because there's been a whole trend in the last 30 to 40 years of like deregulation uh, like especially with the push for globalization right so mm-hmm. that's what we're dealing with yeah i i am totally with you i mean it's i'm not saying we shouldn't tell businesses what to do i think we should i'm just saying that our governments are not very likely to do that um, but the lobbying, um, very much like I was looking at that when I quoted this, when I was looking into this story about this 10 billion deal in Saudi Arabia, um, it also um, transpires that Microsoft has been ba- paying fossil fuel um, lobbying groups to lobby uh, for uh, not phasing out fossil fuels. This is pretty obvious because they think they need a lot more energy than there is at the moment. And so they don't want to phase out fossil fuels. They just want to burn them. And um, but they do this a bit like, you know, you have to go and dig a bit to see that it's them paying for the fossil fuel lobbyists. Right. And and um, yeah, on the other hand, the positive side, I saw that there was a, um, at least a move going to to forbid uh, Amazon from lobbying in the European Parliament, for example, things like that. So <laughs> there is some some um, green shoots here and there, I suppose. Yeah, we need more of those because I'm <laughs> I'm like just like I I need an antidepressant at this point. But like you know, it's like I I I just you know we we need more of those, but we also need to help uh, build more of those. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. Any more questions? I guess I've got one just just completely flipping it to the other side on like personal responsibility. And I'm, I'm not necessarily saying personal responsibility is yeah. something that could ever solve this this problem. But I mean, do, do you 
do you see like personal choices as having a role in solving this issue? Well, and I have a slide on this. Let me oh, show excellent. you. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, I do. Um, wait, let me. I promise we didn't we didn't set this up. <laughs> no, no. Um, so, I, I mean, in fact, it's a few slides. Um, but basically, I think we should personal responsibility is important because actually grassroots um, change works. Um, so, and especially I think as scientists and academics, we, we really have an important example function. And also, if you think of it, people always blame the large comp corporations and for good reasons. But on the other hand, those companies, they sell what we buy, not the other way around. Right. Um, if we wouldn't buy it, they would stop selling it because they want to. Uh, they would sell us something else that we want to buy. So if we don't want to buy it, well, that's it. Uh, so we, if we're really serious about um, um, not liking what the company does, well, then we shouldn't buy their services or goods. And same with in politics. You know, um, the politicians, even if you don't vote for them, they need our votes. So they will be always be listening to um, what's what's alive in the public opinion. And uh, that's not always um, like uniform, right? So um, if you manage to get your, your voice heard, you only need something like a 10% minority and already that's that's a loud voice. So um, that's one thing. And then if you really want to think what you can do yourself in terms of ICT, um, well, considering that the drivers are mostly um, video, AI and IoT and mobile devices, well, then you actually should focus on these. So get as few devices as possible. Use them for as long as possible. Minimize your use of the internet. And really think, I mean, I would personally say don't use AI, but OK, I made that think critically about your use of AI, because um, none of these messages are, are pop popular. right? Um, but that's really what you can do if, if it's about um, IT. But of course, if you look at the big picture, um, not eating meat and uh, not flying and not driving a car um, will have more effect than all these actions. Um, so <laughs> maybe, you know, it depends really um, where you want to focus your actions. Um, but I think this is important also purely like at least you then take some control of things and you it, it will probably allow you to, um, you know, You'll be you'll be in a better position to deal with the situation, I think, purely because you will feel a little bit better about things. Um, I mean, in the end, that's all what this is about, right? Um, we do things because not doing them makes us feel bad, and so so for some people um, that is acting against climate change because you think this is a really bad thing, but other people don't care about that at all. So essentially, the things we do are are um, you know. You know you have to be candid about the reasons for doing them. Um, but nevertheless, these are the things you definitely can do. So, um, because especially with AI, I mean, more people should say, please don't use this, don't use ChatGPT, you know, <laughs> don't use all that stuff. Um, but on the other hand, maybe I'm wrong there. You know, I'm very cynical. You know, Microsoft is losing money for every transaction you do with ChatGPT. So maybe we would, we could kill them simply by overusing. <laughs> 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 because well, they yeah, they clearly didn't think that um, they didn't think through the money model very well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but still, I mean. It's not purely, I, I simply think ethically, for me, it's not acceptable to use something like that. If, if it's not about the, the climate impact, um, you know, the, 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 the whole training practice of AI is deeply unethical. Uh, mm. So the, it's really problematic wherever you look at it. So I'm, I'm really surprised that it's so easy for people to say, oh, yeah, yeah, but, but it's useful for me, so I don't care about it. Um, how they did all that right? yeah yeah anyway these are my two slides about your Great. personal Thank you. things yeah, you can yeah. do <laughs> <laughs> that's really good and um as someone who downloads his fav favorite albums on tidal or spotify equivalent I'm, I'm quite happy that what that at least gets a little bit of a tick there right as opposed to streaming them all the time <laughs> well, <laughs> <It's> ever so slightly <laughs> yes. good 
it's it's always tricky like uh yes oh sorry albert yes one more question on this is that um something that you see in the mining industry and maybe you're meaning that by carbon tax or um in the mining industry when you want to start for example gold mine right you have to pay or at least here in the in colorado um you have to pay upfront cost to clean the site and that makes it really hard for gold miners to start or to continue their operation because they have to put you know millions into a bank account for if they go bankrupt you know government mm -hmm. can step in and clean the site so if that model is adapted you know would would something like that work for uh, big companies and you know when they want to build more and more data centers okay but you know you're producing an awful amount of uh, pollutants as well so you have to take that in consideration and you have to put it in a bank account and we, we will you know capture co2 or, or plant trees or whatever it is right to offset and it, is there well, are there actions that way and i know i realized that you mentioned in your presentation that offsetting is not really the might not be the way to go but um i'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts well, on this for example, you could do this for all the embodied carbon. And if you really do scope three, then this includes all the chip making and so on. And that's a huge amount. Um, and that would already be prohibitive, which, which is good right in this context. Um, for the electricity, it's not so clear because, um, for example, what these companies like Amazon already do is they simply buy wind farms, right? And then, um, so then they claim that they are green, but they are, what they are doing is simply offloading the emissions on, um, on the rest of the world. And um, so it's very hard to see how you can then, as a regulator, say, well, but um, you are uh, you are polluting because they will say, no, no, here, 100% green energy for this data center. You see, that makes it hard, right? Um, so, and I, I'm afraid they might always find this kind of creative um, approaches to, to that problem. With embodied carbon, they can't really do that because, well, you make the chips the emissions are there it's hard all you can do is try and and uh, wiggle out of it by saying but it's not our responsibility but to my mind if you buy the chips it's your responsibility for the pollution caused by making right yeah. um so but yeah i mean it's to my mind it's not the legal side because for example yeah, uh, you start with the mining and clearly um, the mining company could say, well, but we sell on all these uh, these ores that we mine so clearly it's not us really responsible and mm. it doesn't quite work that way. So legally, it becomes, yeah. I think, tricky to assign responsibility and therefore like fin financial uh, contribution. Not that it couldn't be done. I'm sure um, smarter economical minds have been thinking about this. <laughs> um, but for the electricity production in particular, I see this problem that they would simply offload the emissions of people who can't avoid them um, and therefore claim to be green. And so you would have to essentially make a calculation saying yeah but in the tradable volume of space where you are having your operation the uh, carbon intensity is this and therefore you have to pay this much um, it could still be done but that, uh, you know it, it gets a bit too technical for an easy legal framework i think <laughs> okay thank you um, cool we've got a few minutes left so are there any final short questions or shall we wrap up there? Good. Yeah. Thanks so much, Wim. That was that was really interesting and really yeah. good discussion at the end. And yeah, there's lots of stuff in there to reflect on. I think definitely for me around the use of AI, because I'm definitely guilty of turning to Chat GPT <laughs> for things that could just be Googled instead. <laughs> so yeah, lots lots of food oh, well. for thought. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was great. And if, if there's anything that we can do to amplify this message, like if you could send around like some of these publications, some of these reports, besides the ones that, you know, were posted today. Yeah. Um, you Definitely. Know, I, I, I have a blog where there are articles that are more for, for the general public. So that might be a good way. So, that would be, um, that would be great. And it yes. uh, has a very easy URL. It's called limited systems. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> of course. Nice. Nice URL. Yeah. <laughs> nice. No, this is great. I'm I'm teaching in the fall a systems class, and I'm definitely gonna 
tap into. Yeah. Uh, so um, can I just say that I've been putting sustainability learning outcomes in all our programs. And yes. so if this is something that you would like to do, because I think education is really important. Yeah. Um, actually, well, I just put a, a, a write-up about that on my blog as well, so you can read it there. Um, but I, I think it's really important to start with students. Um, yes, and, and, and even yeah. they even they don't want to hear it. Like they, no. they accuse me of pushing a political agenda against growth. I'm like, it's, oh, it's well. <laughs> the dynamics. It's a system dynamics class. Of course, we're going to talk about the limits to growth, you yeah. know, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, they, they, it, people do, but like, then they, it's, it's a lot. It's like, we've got to come up with an alternative. So here and the people here who are staying here and are interested in this, in this space, we need to come up with what, what does mm. an alternative model look like? Because people can't even think about it, even though humans have been on the planet much longer than the idea of growth. <laughs> absolutely um we cannot it's like going back to the caves i'm like no it doesn't have to be that way but we you know no, yeah. some other it things. could be completely i mean it would a steady state economic model is sustainable right <laughs> yeah no for sure for sure but like again all of these ideas have been around for decades and uh -huh. and they're still not taking root and so we've got to figure out what prevents that from happening well we know what prevents that from happening yeah. but like we need to counter that with some other visions mm. for the future yes i'm afraid i mean i, I would have loved to go on, go on for much longer but okay <laughs> Time's well up. this is only this could be just like the start of the conversation it doesn't have to be the end yes. so i'm happy Absolutely, to yeah. you being in touch so thank you so much for doing this this has been wonderful it was a pleasure yeah. Thank you, Rim, and thank you, everybody, for uh, joining this webinar. I think this is the last webinar for the spring. Uh, we will start a new webinar session uh, for the summer fall, um, and I hope to have uh, you know other great talks uh, and maybe also around this topic. Uh, so we're coming up to the hour. The recordings will be posted um, on the CSTMS website, um, and. Maybe if you're um, intending to send any material around, we can include it in the in the posting as well. Uh, um, so okay, yeah, I will do that. Um, I'll send the slides and then a few extra links, perhaps. Great, thank okay. you. Much appreciated. <laughs> thank, thank you, you so and thank you, Sam.